Hello, I'm Dmitry Levkovich, and this is Living the Classical Life. It's so good to have you here on Living the Classical Life. Thank you. So take me back to the, the beginning. So you were born in Ukraine uh, to a musical family. Your father's a composer. And your first professional degree was in composition. So how did you come to, to piano? Whose idea was it to start? I started out in piano. Mm -hmm. um, and then with all the immigrations, um, there would be time that I just didn't have opportunity to practice, and with all the changes, you you, you kind of lose uh, routine, mm -hmm. which seems to be such a, a, a gradual staircase to success. Mm -hmm. And once you break it, you kind of run into trouble mm -hmm. because because then first of all you are growing, and and then you keep a step, and then something goes off the rails and something becomes more awkward but um, yeah that that definitely happened with me um, that I lost some natural steps because I just couldn't practice for some time mm -hmm. but then I needed to express myself musically so so composition was uh, it just it just happened it just uh, it just was a part, the same part of creative, creative process as practicing would be. Mm -hmm. Nothing different. Um, when you express yourself through music, it's a creative process. I always had the impression that probably you could have been self-taught. Were you self-taught or who were your early teachers? Um, aren't we all self-taught? Don't we spend most of the time at the piano just by ourselves and then we see a teacher once a week and get seriously confused and don't go back to the piano for two days and then <laughs> continue our, with our self-teaching. It's a familiar cycle. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think we are, we are all pretty much self-taught. Um, and uh, like with other professions, mathematicians for example, they, they, uh, if they teach, they already know the equations and they know the answer to it. And they can, they come up with creative stuff and they find answers on a daily basis mm -hmm. sometimes. But I think what happens a lot with musicians, especially pianists, I would say that goes really for pianists, mm -hmm. is that we, ha we know all the numbers of the equations and we don't know answers to it. Mm -hmm. When it says, equal sign, we draw a blank. Yeah. Like, um, and so it creates really a problem when there is some 16-year-old uh, who is burning with desire to learn the piano and to really uh, express the most beautiful things or what beauty I find in this Chopin concerto. Or, or, and so I'm looking for a teacher who will teach me, who will, who will spoon feed me, and so I'll be able to express all this beauty which I find in this music. And then there isn't that teacher, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Really. And I believe that our teacher is, <laughs> I'm convinced he's uh, the best there is. Mm -hmm. And he's still, working on it and still growing and still he has a humility to admit that he doesn't know everything but that gives such a room for for exploration and there is still so much to look forward to and to be excited about and you know not not to just sit there um, 
you can't you, you just can't imagine what what uh, what's on the opposite side of the mm -hmm. uh, of that what would you call it the spectrum yeah, on the side opposite the spectrum. side yeah. of the spectrum there are uh, like i know for a fact there is a teacher here in the city who for the last 20 years would watch tv with subtitles while the student was having like, while giving a lesson to a student is that so? Yeah, and uh, That's you know, in <coughs> one of the main schools here, yeah. and and students, we musicians, we are, I mean, we are such children. It's like taking away a candy from a child. Nobody said anything, mm -hmm. you know, because because music teaches us wonderful values. It teaches us to love, to care, to touch the piano with care, to. Um, to daydream, to read Chopin's letters that he wrote, uh, you know, 200 years ago. And, and then I think that those students would probably feel, oh, there must be something wrong with me if I cannot interest that teacher. But um, yeah, so there is this different sides of the spectrum, somebody who is actually himself trying and exploring and I think Sergei shared with us everything that he could possibly offer and when he felt that we need even more help then he would just sit there with us and even I remember even, that and even create some new ways right on the spot which maybe will stir stir us up yeah um, and I remember once, I just insisted that I don't know what fingerings to use in Rachmaninoff concerto. I need your help. I'm like so confused because I have a big reach. Mm -hmm. I can use any fingerings. You know, I can, I can take an octave with 5-2, you know. Should I do that? <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I never played that piece before. And then, and then <coughs> patiently, Sergei was sitting there and putting putting every, every fingering and trying it out in tempo on the piano, the, the piece, and try, uh, remembering what he would use and trying maybe he would come up with something better. It's, it's a real, real care, which, um, which I expect to continue. It's, uh, he, he, has, he has given us something which is difficult to return to him, but it's something which we can give to others. We have to. Do you think that there are certain things that cannot be taught? Can charisma be taught or can it be developed? I remember once listening to entire first two rounds of Cleveland competition when I wasn't taking part in it. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was this Korean girl who came out and you certainly don't expect anything from her. And then just like in, just the, in terms of her personality the, and her Just demeanor. the way that she walked to the piano and, mm -hmm. and her looks. You, and then it was like a Cinderella story. The moment she touched the piano, time stopped. And that's what's true charisma on stage. Mm. Um, there are, for example, some pianists who are very charismatic when they talk, but the moment they touch the piano, the whole charisma goes away. It's like what they say about uh, <clears throat> Some people, the moment they open their mouth, but here it's, it's for pianists, it's, it goes the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. It's, it seems like the actor's work is similar to the musician's work. You could tell a bad actor from his acting, right? <laughs> and so you could tell when, when uh, you could tell when a pianist is just acting it and not really living it, mm -hmm. or when it's all staged like very carefully and it's almost intimidating how well it's staged, but the person is not there. It's just an act. Uh, so in that way, this transformation is, I, I wonder how actors do it. For me, what, what helps me at my uh, performances I feel good about is uh, I get so busy with the sound, I get uh, just taken away. This, with the sound, I forget that that I'm there and uh, I'm I'm too busy. Um, 
also what helped me throughout life is to close my eyes when I play. Hmm. That sort of made made everything in sync. The sound and the touch and the feel of of the key before I take it. I want to talk a little bit about uh, technique because I want to understand the foundations uh, of education for people who have a very um, strong facility at the keyboard. When you were young, were you put on a lot of technical exercises like Czerny or Philippe or uh, Hannon? Not at all. Not at all? No. I don't think I... I don't think I got anywhere with technique really until I started with Sergei. That late? Yeah. Uh -huh. Those that late, so all the odds were against me. Mm -hmm. um, I remember trying to learn La Campanella. You know, after you hear some recording where obviously the pianist is just having fun. When you sit down at the piano and you're ready to have fun and then I couldn't handle even the easiest messages from there. I wouldn't know how to approach it. And also, um, when I was 15, I developed tendinitis. Mm -hmm. Now that's an interesting subject too, which all on its own. <coughs> lasted me four years throughout my studies at Curtis. And it mm -hmm. only went away really after I started studying with Sergei and after he assigned me all this absolutely insane virtuosic works that helped my tendonitis go away. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it helped, it helped that, that uh, Sergei didn't... Uh, it helped that Sergei was a fantastic influence on how to approach piano. Now looking back, and in comparison to all the other teachers that I gotten to know, even by hearing about, first of all, I'm surprised that he never really gave up mm -hmm. on any of us. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised that he believed in something which wasn't even there yet. He could hear the potential of a person before it was at all even noticeable to others. Mm -hmm. And then later, years later, uh, suddenly people see, oh, that person actually, is, uh, it, it was not a waste of time. Wow, so, so you didn't make a mistake with this, uh, with this person. But uh, he, he had incredible ear and what, what would be completely invisible to other musicians. Um, he, he would pick it up from just Basically, from how a person would even connect two notes, and if it's genuine or if it's not. And if, if you would play nothing well, and, but you would connect those two notes genuinely, then you got it. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there are so many young musicians out there, not just the young ones, who are powering through conservatory and they develop overuse injuries. and. A lot of them feel that they can't talk about it, first of all, um, because it implies that the implication is that they have bad technique and that they're doing something wrong and they should know better, right? Um, do you attribute your tendonitis to um, tension issues? Were you, were you uptight at the keyboard? <laughs> well, I attribute it to, to some very impulsive desire of uh, working on myself, so... Aside from starting on uh, working on my technique, that same day I went to the gym, and so I decided to really work on everything <laughs> to really become a man. <laughs> and three days later, I was there, I was and then I just not being able to hold a cup. <laughs> it, first, it was in the right hand, but then I, you know, I'm, I'm a stubborn person, and I kept working with my left hand until I reached the same effect. So I couldn't, I couldn't hold yeah. anything. <laughs> I, I don't remember, was my mom spoon feeding me or what? I, but yeah, it was this kind of tendonitis where you just cannot hold something and pick up a glass or... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a very holistic approach to technique. I'm wondering um, ab about technique. For a pianist in this case, how much of your daily work concerns technique alone, aside from music, or is it approached together? You know, that's 
Great question. Um, Sergey would always say that, first of all, emotional content, and then also work on technique. And he's right, absolutely. Because if, because there are such confusing things, like they say that you have to work on independence of fingers. Mm -hmm. And then when you hear it as a kid, <coughs> I don't know about you, but I think somewhere in my subconscious, I imagined it's independence of fingers from the rest of my body. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sort of implies that, right? You it's, can it's translate it strange, any way. Strange title, yeah. It, uh, but really, probably what it means is independence of fingers from each other. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so there are a lot of these ideas thrown around independence of fingers, stuff, which are which just, uh, which just burden us, but it doesn't answer anything. Yeah. Sorry, what was your question? So I'm just trying to see on a daily basis, how much of the time is devoted separately to technique, if that's how you divide it, or uh, to musical concerns, practicing the repertoire. I know he would practice scales, mm -hmm. and that's one thing which I never did and never will. Do really? in my life, yeah. Yeah. Also, like Richter, never well, did a scale in his life. Well, it's boring. <laughs> I mean, is that what music is supposed to be about? Is that what those composers did? Did they write this stuff to make us suffer, make us practice? Yeah. It's just, it just um, defeats a purpose, I think. To practice something um, uh, in the rhythms, for example. Or does it make sense to practice uh, all your life some strange automatic exercises? Is that, is that what you want the rest of your life to look like? Are you looking forward to that? <laughs> Who's paying you <laughs> to do that to yourself? <laughs> so, so somehow I, I just know there has to be a different answer. Otherwise, I don't want anything to do with this profession. And I see that there are are the musicians who, who actually keep in shape on, on real pieces, not exercises. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the reasons why I was so excited to have you on this show is because you represent to me the quintessential free-spirited, freelancing musician, artist. And I know that that comes with particular challenges because there's always an expected route in our supposed career, right? So if I had to divide that into two categories roughly, there would be the pianists who try to make it through competitions. And by last count, you won top prizes in 17 or 18 major competitions around the world. Then the, what follows from that is that the pianist will try to have a career take off from those competition wins or through other combined momentum. On the other side, you have pianists who try to I don't want to dismiss this as playing it safe, but having a, a steady job at, a, mm. at an institution does feel nice, having a paycheck, right? Instead of not knowing what I happens wonder. next. <laughs> I wonder how does it really feel? How does that feel? So they'll go through a doctoral route, right? Yeah. And that is not the route that you're taking. And so I'm so curious to know, you know, what's the development now? You've just put out an amazing recording, Rachmaninoff, uh, album, which I, th I think is fantastic, but for pianists out there, how do they f how do they even fund a, a recording? Let's say you're a freelancing pianist. How do you fund a recording? That's a good question. I got lucky. Uh, this, it was basically commissioned to me, the recording. So that's why uh, only now I have my first CD out. You won a lot of competitions. Did you feel like that? changed the trajectory. You know, I think just the fact that I, uh, I won some competitions and that I went to, with, uh, to enough of them, it's, it seems like, oh, that must have been your goal. You really <laughs> went, to, you went to win, yeah. didn't you? <laughs> you bad, bad boy. You wanted to like, you wanted to beat those other guys, yeah? You, you wanted to, to feel important, huh? That's, that's why you went. But in reality, no, I, I went because it helped me to, to pull myself together. It helped me 
to forget about uh, all of my doubts and focus on that deadline. I have to be on stage at that time and I will have to be as ready as I can be. It helped me to make the next step forward. That's why I went. I didn't go to win and I actually was surprised. I was for many years, I was wondering why are they giving me prizes? Hmm. Is it for my, for, you know, is it for a pretty smile or something like this? And some people gave me that attitude. Oh, you know, he winning at this, you know, some, some prize. But um, yeah, it helped me develop. And I knew that as many minuses as there are and as much as it contaminated my thoughts a lot, uh, just running into uh, some characters, especially in the jury, uh, it does contaminate your thoughts. Um, but there are a lot of uh, pluses too. Is there a risk in doing too many competitions? Well, um, I don't know. I'm not sure. I didn't do too many, I don't think. I have a, a close friend of mine who, who did some competitions and didn't do particularly well at some point and started to get very depressed. Well, it's important to listen to your feelings and not to put yourself in the harm's way for no reason, right? Yeah. I, I think flexibility and, and not just doing what you have to do, but also listening to your heart is just having that balance. It's, uh, it's uh, everything. I want to know about your recording process because this uh, Rachmaninoff disc is an achievement. How long did you play these pieces on stage before you recorded them? Um, actually, the first 11 preludes I had to learn, basically. I had maybe about nine months, which is enough for, you know, to, to give birth. But uh, I, I couldn't even really start working on it until three months or four months before the recording. So that was a lot of pressure. And um, however, the last Opus 32, I played, I think, since 10 years before the recording or more, um, more than 10 years. I feel like the Opus 32 was one of my first successes as a, uh, as a pianist with, uh, after studying, uh, after beginning my studies with Sergei. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's really scary to record your first CD. And you know, you were telling me all about your first CD. And, uh, and I was just fascinated. I couldn't believe that. How did you do it? I was, I was scared as a little girl, you know. I just needed to hide behind my mama and <laughs> hold, hold her skirt, protect me, that kind of thing. Um, How many because you feel like after it's recorded, it's done. It's out there. You cannot change anything. And, and you don't know what to expect from recording process. You don't know what, exactly what kind of piano you will get. You don't know what kind of team you will get. You might even get a sound engineer, like once I had an experience, which didn't really work out because I was adjusting to the piano and the piano was quite plain. It didn't have many layers. Um, and we started recording and things were not going smoothly. I didn't feel comfortable and that's probably the first thing which I look for at the piano. First to feel to feel comfortable, to enjoy myself. Um, and there the sound engineer said, okay, uh, take number three. Do it right this time. Wow. <laughs> so you can run into this kind of sound engineer which, you know, you, you cannot iman, imagine it in your wildest nightmares, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> During the recording session. So it involves so many things and so many aspects, which before you record a CD, you just are not aware of. Mm -hmm. 
for people who are not familiar with the re recording process, how, how many days were you given to record this album? Actually, only two days. Which That's was not a lot of time. Usually people get three days, but here, mm -hmm. you know, the repertoire was kind of need three days. I mean, 24 of my preludes, seriously. Well, maybe not for you, but Actually, that's demanding. <laughs> that's I'm, I'm, I'm so kidding, I'm so kidding. This is probably, in note-wise, it's probably one of the most dense, uh, uh, dense books there are. If, if you open a book of Rachmaninoff preludes, you realize, oh, it has like 10 voices going at once yeah. most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, so, so yeah, that was really intense and crazy experience and I remember the first day I recorded probably six hours or seven hours and the second day I felt like I'm not having my interpretive ideas out there and there is maybe four hours late I have to do something for four hours left for the entire recording I have to do something you know and there is this pressure while you're recording so I would go out for um, a smoke or for some lunch and on the spot I was thinking I have to do something what what do I do what do I do and I remember this fantastic idea crossed my mind about two hours before the before we finished recording because that day I was recording for 11 hours 11 hours yeah it was intense and so after nine hours knowing that this is it but not all of my ideas are on tape so one thing crossed my mind, and I'm going to sound like I'm doing some ad here, but that saved me. I went to a store across the street from the recording studio, and I got myself a Red Bull. <laughs> Where is Red Bull? Someone give me one. <laughs> and, and yeah, suddenly there was this burst of energy, and. And you would think, oh, and then I recorded all of this virtuosic stuff. No, not necessarily. Yes, some virtuosic stuff, but that's when the last prelude of the Opus uh, 23 finally came out, right? And I felt like it happened on one breath. I was with the music. There was this energy. There was, you know, my heart was beating from Red Bull probably, but it was, it was there. I could feel it. <laughs> and that was just, yeah, I, I could really keep going for 11 hours and because so because of because of some some decisions you have to be flexible as a musician adjust to as, as a pianist you have to adjust to so many things does it matter for you where you're performing and the specific reason i ask this is recently you came to cleveland and you played with a community orchestra and you played Rachmaninoff third concerto and for me it was i felt like you were giving the performance of a lifetime and i was moved to tears does it does it matter to you whether you're playing in Carnegie Hall or with a community orchestra in a theater? You know, what matters about community orchestras is that you run into more people who are really into it rather than professional orchestras or conductors. <laughs> 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 they really enjoy, they're actually, they want to be there. And that cannot be said for the professional orchestras or conductors out there. Yeah. Sometimes even I don't want to be there. Gosh, sometimes I have to go to a performance. I don't want to go. I would rather just cancel and stay home <laughs> and just continue, continue enjoying this wonderful music, which I prepared for that performance coming up. But that was the best part, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so what do you do on those days when you have to play and you just don't feel like it's happening, you're not, you're not into it on that day, the concentration is not happening? Actually, on stage, when I have audience, when I know there are those people who love music, and I, I try not to think about those people who are pianists and who came to criticize, you know? I actually play for those people that, that are there because, because they just love music. And something happens to me, I, uh, I really give more than I do during the run-throughs or during uh, my practicing. And I think it's one of the, one of the things on which really help performers who travel a lot, who perform every three days. 
because I had that experience once that I was running through the same program maybe seven or eight times pretty much in a row and being on stage consistently I remember it, it, it helped me a lot first of all I was not just practicing not just practicing how like with preserving energy how we do we, we cannot really be there at home at the piano spilling you know our hearts not every moment we are yeah. at the piano i mean we would we would be there and die probably yeah <laughs> doing that nine hours every day yeah. forget it but doing that every three days that really keeps you in some phenomenal shape i think mm -hmm. i mean from my experience i um, that's a real practice that um, where you practice everything. You just don't just practice aspects of it. Mm -hmm. you, you're practicing everything. It's all together. So I, I think that's a big advantage of being on stage a lot. So Dima, we were talking so much about the challenging aspects of the young performing life, but I think it's also important to talk about the fact that we've been very lucky in our musical lives and we can talk about the beautiful things that we get to experience. For me, that includes being in the studio that we were in and that formed the basis of many of my life's best friendships. <laughs> Going back to the topic of Sergei, whenever I would feel, I don't think he really let me feel that idea of what's the point you know, what's the, what the point? It's anyway not gonna happen. I don't think he really let me feel that ever because I would come to the lesson and just the way that uh, the, the attitude with which he would approach the piano, that excitement of, of touching the, the piano which gave him so many happy, happiest moments of his life. And you can tell a musician who approaches something which gives him pleasure, not only pleasure, but a lot of it, really, and the meaning of to keep going. And, to, and back at, yeah, when I was at Curtis, I would go to all the piano seminars, so I also saw a lot of different teachers. And I remember getting a similar feeling from Claude Frank. Mm -hmm. All students would play, and very often a teacher wouldn't even touch the instrument. Um, but I remember Claude Frank, he would just always say, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And then he would sit at the piano, and just in his whole posture, even if you don't see his hands, you just feel, especially if you're um, empathical or empathetical person, you can feel his posture that he loves this. This is it. This is really worth it. Um, and and so going for lessons with Sergei were just inspiring only for that reason, because he would he would somehow share with us without even words the real excitement about being part of it. Dima, thank you so much for being here, for sharing so many insights into your life and your work and your process. And it's been a pleasure for me personally to have such a close friend on the show. Oh. <laughs>